least that other countries couldn't avoid uh, this topic. Uh, so, uh, and with these two gentlemen today, I'm going to try to explore these things uh, more in detail. Um, let me start with you, uh, uh, Ambassador Gobash. Like when we were looking at the uh, World Economic Forum, the main theme there was that history is at a, at a turning point. So my question for you is, do you actually agree? Is history is a turning point? And what is actually still the future of multilateralism? What is the future of countries still working together? Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hardly hear myself. Uh, maybe we should turn up the volume so that the entire... Uh, yeah, let's book, turn up book, the volume. That's a good idea. The entire book fair can hear us. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, interesting that you mentioned the World Economic Forum, Davos, I'm assuming. It's a, it's, um, it's a forum that I've never attended. Uh, because I don't see it as part of multilateralism. I, I see it as an international cooperation ground to a halt. You had people, uh, governments openly talking about moving production lines closer to home because they realized that suddenly they were dependent on other countries for vital things that their people needed now. And they didn't want to wait for five other countries to get their act together. When the Chinese early on had locked down 2020, um, I remember the horror in America as they realized that their favorite headache remedy, ibuprofen, came 100% from China. And they said, what do we do? We've got to find a way of making it closer to home or at home, you know, that sort of thing. The European Union, I don't know if there are any Europeans in the audience, but they, they tend to be a bit complacent about how they're the global poster child for regional cooperation. The Schengen visa, for example. Well, the first victim of the pandemic was the Schengen visa. The Schengen countries threw up barriers between each other. One of the first European countries to have a bad experience of the pandemic was Italy. What do the rest of the Europeans do? Do they rally around in a spirit of multilateral regional cooperation? No, sir. They imposed export controls in Italy. They imposed barriers on people coming out of Italy. I mean, this is what happened in Europe. And the truth is that I think, while obviously all of this is eased up now, we often show our real selves when things are really bad. And when things were at their worst in the pandemic, multilateralism was the first casualty, whether at the regional level or the global level. As you know, President Trump announced America pulling out of WHO. You had Trier and the Netherlands. They may not have won power, but they've come this close to winning power. So you have to ask yourself, uh, what do we do? I mean, are the ideals still worth holding up and still worth articulating and still worth defending and fighting for? Because ideals are always worthwhile but have no illusions that everyone is living up to the ideals. Above all, the ones who are preaching are the ones who are often the most willing to abandon them when it doesn't suit them. Okay. Um, Ambassador Gobash, to follow up on actually what was now uh, discussed, uh, I'm from Belgium myself, so a relative smaller country. So how can smaller countries stay relevant in the international community? What's your advice for, for countries like us? Uh, I have no specific advice for Belgium. I mean, I wish you all the luck in the world. <laughs> uh, obviously, we have to tread carefully. It's not so straightforward, uh, you know, sort of choosing our, our partners and our friends. Uh, and there is this uh, very, very powerful narrative about countries being free and sovereign and independent and able to choose whoever they want. But then, you know, when push comes to shove, clearly there are dominant, uh, there, there, there are dominant partners and sort of subordinate partners. Um, you, you, we, we just need to read, um, how, how, does, how do you say it, read, read the coffee cup, the tea leaves? Um, we know what side we're on, uh, and our, our best strategy is to figure out how to accommodate ourselves to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Ambassador Gobaj already touched on uh, soft power, and uh, as we can see you a bit as the, the godfather of... Uh, the prism through which people see Russia. Um, uh, you know, when the Chinese were cracking down on Tiananmen Square, however many kung fu movies you liked, that wasn't going to be the principal image. So hard power has a tremendous capacity to undermine your soft power attempts, anything you try and do consciously. Hard power is exercised. Soft power is evoked. It's what people associate with your country when they just hear your country's name, for example. Um, and that's where I think Till fairly recently, India scored very well because, you know, I happened to be a UN official traveling in the Gulf countries uh, when we had the results of our 2004 elections. And every minister, every senior official I met was just going absolutely incredulous about the fact that here in this country, not that far away from the Gulf, 
you have a, a country where the election had been won by a, a woman political leader of Italian descent and Roman Catholic faith who had just made way for a Sikh to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim president in a country 80% Hindu. And I said, you know, we're not doing this to impress anybody. This is just the way India is. And it really won a lot of admiration. Now, is India still like that? Obviously, there are some serious questions that are being asked. Uh, developments in our domestic environment at home have changed things a little bit uh, for the worse. But I do believe that soft power is not something that you can um, escape one way or the other. I mean, you can either gain from it or you can undermine it through just what you do at home. Uh, soft power is essentially about having a good story to tell about yourself. And if you are the land of the better story, you will have soft power. And if you are a land where everyone is telling terrible stories about you, however hard you try, you won't have any. Thank you. Ambassador Gobash, the UAE was quite well in telling their story in recent years, as we could see in the Global Soft Power Index, the UAE is now number 15 worldwide. Um, so I was wondering, what is UAE's secret there? And as well, like in, in your capacity of heading the Office of Public and Culture Diplomacy, how does public and cultural diplomacy helps with UAE soft power? Well, I'm going to disagree with Shashi and, oh, and, great. and, and tell you that, in fact, uh, my office is responsible for getting us so high up on the list of soft power. Public diplomacy, Public of diplomacy, absolutely. And I'm not going to tell you my secret of how we do it. I'm kidding, of course. It's, uh, it's very, very difficult to figure out wh whether a government or, or even an institution can actually push soft power. I'm actually thinking that I, I, I do agree that it is, it's a kind of an expression of culture, uh, and it's almost accidental. So the way I, in which I look at the Emirates, I mean, it's, it's, it, Dubai is obviously uh, the, the, the key player within the soft power um, kind of constellation of the Emirates. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but I, I'm assuming they sort of fell into it by accident. Emirates Airlines is just such a superb airline. Um, they focused on the product, and that product then spoke for the country as a whole. Uh, and then, of course, you, you, you started getting copycats, both Etihad and Qatar and you know, sort of other airlines. Uh, it's, it's also straightforward. I think it's, uh, it's, 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 there's something about the character in Dubai that allows for people to, to uh, connect with it on a very kind of visceral level. Uh, other places that try to tell a story are a little too sophisticated, a little too particular, and it doesn't quite gel. Um, and I, so I think you know, we take advantage of, of the, um, the, the, the spirit of Dubai to then allow that to kind of cover the entire Emirates. Now, I'm, I'm probably not going to get promoted for this, but I, I, do, uh, I do think that you know, we have to be honest with ourselves and sort of see what is it that really makes the success of the Emirates come out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daour. Can a country just survive on soft power? No. I mean, let's face it. Um, I think Hillary Clinton had come up with that clever expression, smart power, which is essentially a combination of both hard and soft. If you have hard power without soft power, you're basically just a bully, and people don't like bullies. But if you have soft power without any hard power, you're essentially confessing your weakness, right? You need somehow to have just the right amount of hard power to back up your soft power. America has a lot of soft power. I mean, they're the land of Coca-Cola, Levi's jeans, McDonald's, you know, Disney, uh, all of these things, Hollywood, everything that the, that the, the products of a, a culture that the rest of the world find attractive. The, the old joke about all the protesters outside American embassies during the Vietnam War and so on, screaming, Yankee, go home, but take me with you. You know, and this was the, this was the, um, the thing about America. But because they had the hard power, they had the clout to actually exercise their influence around the world in ways that, frankly, um, people had to take seriously as well. Um, I can't really think easily of a country of any size that relies solely on soft power. Uh, who could you think of, Omar? I, not easy, right? I mean, every country has to also have a certain credibility emerging from, from hard power. Now, I'm not saying that soft power alone in any case is going to work because, I mean, uh, it's, it's quite astonishing that um, these hijackers, suicide bombers of 9-11, their last meal was at a McDonald's. So you can point to a McDonald's and say, what well, a great example of soft power didn't save the World Trade Center, right? Or indeed, I, we had a similar situation here where some terrorists, uh, the last thing they did before attacking a marketplace in, in India a few years ago was watch a Bollywood movie. 
which is again supposed to be our soft power at work. So I don't, I don't want to exaggerate uh, that soft power is, 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 is a panacea for anything. I think you've got to have both. And you've got to somehow strike a, a, a reasonable balance. If you, if you are too heavy handed with your hard power, you will lose friends. Um, you need the soft power to at attract. I mean, the whole logic uh, of Nye's theory was that if you actually can attract people to you, you can economize on the sticks and carrots that hard power requires. And that is a reasonable thing, but you still need the sticks and carrots. You know, uh, Th Theodore Roosevelt's famous line, um, speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. So speaking softly is your soft power, but that big stick you still need, otherwise people are not going to listen to you when you speak softly. So I, I sometimes wonder, hard power, does it refer only to uh, military power? And economic might. And economic, exactly. So I was thinking of Switzerland, I was thinking also of the Emirates. We have soft power, but we also have a certain amount of hard power, which is essentially uh, petrodollars and also a financial mm. system that allows people sure. to deploy those, uh, their own money. So, right. um, uh, now, yeah, so people would say that might be soft power, that might be hard power. Having a clear sense of identity and a backbone so that you don't just get pushed around uh, where, where, you know, by, by larger, larger states. I think that also, if you, can, if you can pull it off and you can be consistent about your principles, then you'll find that other larger powers will take you into account and maybe you know, p p provide a bit more respect. Right. And I think that's an issue for smaller countries, actually, to be taken seriously. The example is I think Belgium the... hasn't made enough of Tantin. <laughs> that's true. That, that's one of the best export products, actually. Absolutely. So you're right. You're right. <laughs> right. Um, now we, we're talking here all, as well about soft power because with the uh, new technologies, you can actually have an easier access to uh, to soft power. You have an easier access to actually to showcase what your country is doing.